Hello and welcome everyone. I'm so happy to see everyone here. Welcome, welcome to our event where we are gonna be talking about effective communication for the workplace. And we are so happy to have our guest, um, Christina Darqua is gonna, is gonna talk with us and share some of her experiences and observations to help you be uh, a better and more effective communicator. So welcome, welcome everyone. Let me, uh, if I can share with you a little bit about Christina in case you don't know her. She, um, <clears throat> she's the CEO and co-founder <clears throat> of Gem Kitchen, a food processing and catering hub located in Kampala, Uganda. It provides outside catering for events, meals, and food supplies for households. She has over eight years of experience in inclusive finance, specialty, microinsurance, and microfinance, and has led teams to set up successful operations across Africa. Working with institutions such as Turaco in Uganda, Microinsure, now MIC Global in Ghana, and Africa offices, and Opportunity International Savings and Loans. Christina has led the establishment of country operations, acquired and managed key partnerships, and optimized operations, processes, and systems. She's also been involved in recruiting and training for team members and partners. She is passionate about excellence, mentoring the youth from all walks of life, gardening, home management, and she loves cooking. Mrs. Darkwa holds a, B, a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from Ashesi University in Ghana and has obtained management training from Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women, um, Emerging Leaders, and Microinsurance Certification from ILO, FSD, ITC Partnerships, in Uganda, amongst others. She currently resides in Kampala, Uganda with her family of five, her husband, herself, and her three adorable children. Welcome, welcome. So happy, so, so happy to have you here with us. And welcome, welcome all of you who have uh, come to join us today to talk about effective communication. So for today, Christine and I have been working and talking and planning this session. And we're going to share with you, go through, kind of talk about these elements of what is effective communication in the workplace, what are common mistakes before and during the job, best practices, some overall tips and strategies, and then lastly, some helpful resources. All right. And so for beginning, Christine, tell us, for you, what is effective communication? Thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, good evening, good afternoon to all present here. I'm really honored and privileged to come talk to you about this subject, because in our daily work, we do complicate with, with people, whether it's um, intentional or not, right? And simply communication in the workplace is the exchange of ideas between um, two people, to the minimum. Now, when we talk about effective communication, there are many definitions to it, but in a nutshell, I would say effective communication takes place when a receiver or recipient receives an intended information from the sender accurately. So the sender sends an information and the recipient needs to receive it and act on it as the sender intended. So if there's a gap somewhere in the communication line, it means there hasn't been an effective communication taking place. And communication takes place by at least four, four modes or four methods. There's a verbal communication, there's nonverbal, we also have visual and written communication. Thank you so much. That's such a, a clear explanation of something that's actually can sort of complex. Um, yeah. Can you share with us, um, what are different types of communication in the workplace? Okay, so I'll go into more details here about the methods of communication. 
we have the verbal communication that's in the form of speech. So when speaking, we have conversations with people and we also um, interact with people during interviews and calls in the workplace. And, and um, during these verbal communications, there are also four sub, sub levels to it. You can talk to yourself or can have a dialogue with yourself and that is intrapersonal um, communication or a conversation with yourself. We also have interpersonal where it, it, it goes beyond you as a person. So there's a second person involved, right? So a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a supervisor or a subordinate in the workplace is an interpersonal communication. We also have another where it's for a small group, small group of people. It could be a team meeting or it could be um, a standard meeting with a team. That's also like just a small group of conference, board meetings and stuff like that. Then we have a um, public communication where it involves presentations and public speaking. Very, very interesting. You know, we all kind of laughed at the interpersonal, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's, I've actually read that the interpersonal communication can be very powerful. Like if you if you have something really challenging to do that day and you do the interpersonal conversation with yourself of saying, oh, Elizabeth, you got this, you, you can do it, no problem. Yeah. They find people succeed more. So yeah. it, so the interpersonal is important too. Yeah, it uh, what is about very important. And I can share an example. Personally, when I get to the office, right, and I'm about to start my day, there are times when I have a lot on my mind. <laughs> I ask myself, where do I start from? One thing that helps me is when I just write down my thoughts. Once I write it down, everything seems easy peasy for me. Now I can start my day and go according to plan. So intrapersonal may sound funny, but it does happen and it's very, very effective. Yeah. Thank you so much. What about nonverbal? So nonverbal communication involves you speaking with your voice. <laughs> And in that you have to be mindful of your tone, how you sound, um, your facial expressions and postures. So all of these can be grouped to a term called um, your body language, right? So with nonverbal communication, your body speaks more. Mm -hmm. Someone says, I can't hear what you are saying, but your body is telling me all that, <laughs> all that I need to know. So you could be communicating with someone and uh, you were sending a message across by speaking, but your postures, you, you not making eye contact, or that is saying something totally different from the intended message. Yeah. So mm -hmm. true, it's so true. Like if someone has their arms folded like this, it can send such a message of, I don't wanna hear what you're saying, or I'm not right. happy with what you're yeah. saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what about written communication? So written communication is what we are mostly used to in the workplace. And these comes in the form of letters, memos, reports, and emails. And now there's another level, which is even the social network in the corporate setting, like using Slack. There are, there are entities that also use um, apps like WhatsApp to communicate. So though it may, WhatsApp is a social media, app that is used globally or used by different people for different reasons, some companies use WhatsApp and you still should be mindful of how you communicate using WhatsApp. So emails, letters, memos, reports are the types of um, written communication that you have. And you know, it's such a good point. Uh, earlier last year in the fall, we had a guest speaker, Professor Leclerc, I don't know if you all remember, but he was he talked he talked about negotiation. But years ago, he told me one time he said, "You know, Elizabeth, emails are going to become too slow. They're going to go. <laughs> they're going to become obsolete." And I'm like, "No way! No way is email going to be obsolete." But we see it now more and more. There's the Slack and yeah. the WhatsApp is so much mm -hmm. faster, and yeah. it's becoming more and more acceptable in uh, in the workplace. Yes. Our last one, tell us, tell us your thoughts on visual communication. So visual communication involves the use of photographs, 
videos and, and films. And another aspect of visual communication in the workplace is I mean, the use of PowerPoints, right? So you can prepare a PowerPoint presentation, but you'll not be there to present it. So you have to make sure that whatever communication or whatever information you are sending across is communicating the intended message. It shouldn't be, PowerPoint shouldn't be too wordy. It has to be more pictorial. It's so true. It's so true. And um, yeah, if uh, if people have comments, share them in chat. We are going to have a Q&A session at the end. So <clears throat> if you have questions, uh, please let us know. And PowerPoint is so true. There has to be enough text so that we can understand what it is, but not so much that we're just reading. You know, yeah. it's that balance. Yeah. <clears throat> um, great. So um, talking about effective communication, why is it so important? So in, um, effective communication is important because we'll, when, when we are communicating or we're in the workplace, we we'll want to um, have as much or as less stress as much as possible. And stress can come out about <laughs> when there's confusion, right? Probably your supervisor or your manager has, has sent you a directive with text as to how to go about something and you don't understand. But if you don't go back and ask questions, you are likely to perform the task wrong. And there will be misunderstanding and it has ripple effects. So when communication is done effectively, it avoids com confusion and that will bring about less misunderstanding. Also, it provides um, a clear direction and purpose. So if there's ambiguity in the communique, obviously there will be misunderstanding. So it's important that when there's communication in the workplace, the, it, it should be clear, the directive should be clear and it should be purposeful. In addition, it also builds um, a positive and healthy company culture. When everyone understands their roles and, the, and, then, and their level in the company, it promotes high self-esteem and the environment is not threatening to any staff member. We all know that we are all key to the company's growth and we have to play our roles very well. Hmm. Lastly, it also creates accountability. If I'm a salesperson and I know my targets, I know that I am responsible for this role. I'm responsible for bringing about 1,000 sales in a month. And if my supervisor or my manager has communicated this to me very well, I, will not, I, don't, have to, I don't need to have excuses, right? So I'm accountable. I become accountable for, for my, my, my task and I have to make sure that I deliver. And all in all, it promotes business success. Once every single member of the team understands the role they play and they execute their task very, very well, there's business success eventually. So it's, it's really a central part of any, any business or, or any professional enterprise. Um, when it's so important, how do we know if we're being successful in our, in, our, in our communication. So in order to be sure that our communication is effective or is successful, it needs to have a combination of what I'll call the five Cs. I usually recommend, or say, it should have at least three of these. And number one is clarity. Your message should be very, very clear. And if you have facts to back up, your, your information, do so. An example is in, um, in an appraisal. As a manager, I need to communicate to my staff that I'm going to appraise you at the end of the month. And I need to be specific about the date. Is it going to be a quarterly appraisal, a monthly appraisal, half year or annual? And the date should be specified. So it's clear. 
and the staff will have to understand this and work towards meeting meeting the, the deadline so that appraisal will be successful. Yeah. So, Boy, I'd, love, I'd love to have you as, a, as my manager. <laughs> You're so clear in your messaging. I'll work for you any day. Yeah. The second is the, the message must be correct. So correct in the sense that the diction should be right. That's your choice of words should be right. Your spelling, there shouldn't be any typos. Grammar should also be on point and the tone should also be right. So all these should be. And uh, the, your sentences also have to be complete. You should not leave room for ambiguity. When you're sending a message across, be it written or oral, it's important to complete your sentences so that your audience or the receiver clearly receives the intended purpose of the message. Yeah. The fourth one is concise. This is quite self-explanatory. <laughs> It should be straight to the point. No beating about the bush. Straight to the point. If you have three points to describe, just say, okay, point one, point two, point three is this, and we move on. Yeah, no time wasted. Fifth is compassionate. In as much as there may be offenses here and there, or subordinates would do or perform their task, not as intended, as a manager, you should still stay positive. And don't, don't, don't shout on your subordinates. You shouldn't be judgmental. You need to actually apply emotional intelligence when you are communicating with your team. Mm -hmm. And so should a subordinate to the supervisor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes both ways. It goes, it goes both ways. ways. Yeah. So multi-layered, so multi-layered. Mm -hmm. So now that we have a sense of what effective communication is, why it's important and how to judge if we're doing it well. Can we look at effective communication bef like while you're applying for a job, before you have the job, and then when you're on the job? So, so we're looking so in at- my eight years experience, I've had the opportunity to recruit for about six years during my, my uh, time in the corporate world. And there are quite a number of errors or mistakes I see applicants make. But today we'll just talk about a few for the interest of time. The, the first is sending an email or sending a job application with only the document attached without a, uh, a text in the body of the email. Sorry, yeah. this is upsetting as a recruiter. Mm -hmm. It's highly unacceptable. It's highly unacceptable. Another is the poor naming of application documents. Oh, There's sorry, also that didn't work. Yeah. yeah. Here's it. So you'd see a, a candidate sending an application and the resume is named copy of copy of or just CV or just resume. And it's not right. The best way to do that is write your name, full name, and the the, the type of document you are sending. It could be a resume, a CV, or a cover letter. You could also write your name, add the date and year yeah. as well. So it's easy for the recruiter to, to select your document, or even when he, he or she downloads a document from the, from the email, don't give the recruiter extra work by naming your files for you. If I have thousand applications, I'll just put yours away. I'm sorry. <laughs> Christina, <laughs> on, on average, how many how many applications would you receive when you were recruiting someone or had an opening? So example, if you have an opening for um, a sales officer, you could you could have roughly about 20 to 25. Mm. Yeah. And That's a so lot. Are coming yeah that's a lot <laughs> so i i wouldn't want to be renaming documents for any applicant and if you send me an email without any text in the body i'm sorry you would have to be kicked out because the, the the vetting process begins from when you submit your application 
a well written email gives you an opportunity for an interview. If not, and if there are no other candidates, then you may have a chance. But if there are so many good candidates, you will not have a chance. So the the impression you make starts with that even that very first email that you sent. Exactly. So you need to make sure you do it well. Exactly. Yeah. And another another um, error is where candidates don't prepare their resumes or CVs to suit the role they are applying for. Well, the yeah, well, there's a, there's a role for um, an account executive, but their CV is best for um, let's say a salesperson. They just sent it out. Assume this person is lazy. You didn't yeah. take time to to tweak your resume to see the role you are applying applying for because you have lots of experience, right? Or different kinds of experiences, and the role you are applying for may not be. Um, may, may not the, the resume will not speak to the role you are playing you are applying for. So it's it's important to take time and modify the resume or CV or even write your cover letter to suit the role you are applying for. You need to highlight your strong skills that makes you best place for that for that job. Excellent. If people want examples of how to do that, I can post it onto the Baobab chat later. You can give me a thumbs up if you want me to do that. You can give me yeah. a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. All right. What about what about during the interview? Okay. So congratulations, you've been shortlisted for the job you've applied for. Now, how do you make sure you stand out amongst the many applicants? One of the errors I found out is candidates don't prepare properly for the interview. One is in the appearance, how they dress. As a recruiter, when I see a candidate coming in, he's a, a gentleman or a man and he has baggy trousers or a sagging trouser without a belt, obviously it's a put off. I will not see you as a, as a serious candidate, no. And some also come into the interview and they don't really know what they're applying for. They don't know the job they're applying for. So you apply for a job, I don't even know this, the, the JD. You don't ask, <laughs> what's the job description? You know, you're just coming in. Others also don't do good research about the company, knowing the company's mission, their vision. And aside that, even the location, if it's a physical interview, we need to know where the company is located. And it's important to estimate how long it's going to take you to get there with traffic or without traffic. And you make sure you arrive on time. So I'll tie this to the last point being lateness. You make sure you know where the company is located, prepare properly, get there ahead of time, at least 30 minutes before your scheduled time of the interview. So it sets you apart from the rest. Another mistake is distractions from gadgets. You in an interview room and your phone is ringing. It doesn't speak to all of you. You need to put your phone on silence or just put it off completely so there aren't any distractions. During the interview also, it's important to pay attention. I've seen or I've experienced candidates who had very, very, very low concentration during an interview. An example I have is I was um, just having a chat with a prospective stuff and the interview was in my house anyway so as i was speaking to her this lady was listening but her eyes were all over she was either looking at the gardener tending the garden she was just going this way looking this way and in my mind i said to myself no lady you're not you're not, you're not cut for it i'm speaking to you you're not making eye contact rather you're looking around and that doesn't speak well i can foresee trouble should I take it on? Yeah. So it's important to prepare for the interview. Make sure you're not distracted from gadgets. You need to pay attention, be an active listener, make eye contact, and don't be late for the interview. You know, Angela told, was telling us that we were talking about distractions. Mm -hmm. And she said with her phone, she puts it on. God, what was it again, Angela? Uh, 
the focus where focus. It, you yeah focus so you can turn off all alerts or everything so that you don't get any distractions mm -hmm. from your phone yeah i started doing that i'm so much more productive let's look at our next one what about after the interview after the interview this is um a part of the job application process that many people are not aware of or are ignorant of. It's very, very important or it sets you apart if you request for feedback on how you performed at the interview. Be it whether you were accepted for the role or not. If you are accepted, you can find out how did I do, why did I, or how come I got selected amongst the many applicants, what made me step out what made me excel you need to know so that you can do better on your next interview if you didn't get the job it's also important for you to know so that you prepare better for your next interview there may be some errors that you made that you are not aware of so if these are brought to your knowledge you prepare yourself better for the next job application and should an opening come up, you may be called. You never know because we see that you are different from the rest. And most importantly is the thank you notes. It's, thank it's, it's, you. It's, yeah. yeah, thank you for talking about this because I get a lot of questions from people about thank you notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th 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 thank you notes sets you apart. It makes you a different kind of person. It portrays you as a different kind of person. So after an interview, it's it's a good thing to do to send your recruiter thank you notes. I guess for the opportunity. Just send them um, thank you. Great. I'm yeah. I have for you here an example. If anyone is wondering, like, what should I put in my thank you note? This is a nice template. Um, mm -hmm. it's a nice template. I don't know if there's someone who wants to read it for us. Is there someone who would like to read it for us? Uh, Naturinda, Emmanuel. All right, Emmanuel, you can unmute yourself. All right, thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, great. All right, so it reads like, uh, Dear Mr. Stroke Mrs. XX, thank you again for meeting with me today regarding the sales position with XYZ Company. Our interview solidified my desire to work with your team, and I'm confident I can be an asset to your company. I am available for any follow-up questions you or your team at XYZ might have. I look forward to hearing from you regards XX. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, reading that for us. Oh my gosh, oh, I have an error in my PowerPoint. Oh well, go ahead, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. So looking, so once you're, we looked at when you're applying for the job, let's look at um, once you're on the job, what are some best practices and things to avoid that you've seen in your in your experience, Christina? Yeah. And so one is, um, it's actually a big one for me. It's my number one. I'm happy with staff or team members who are detail oriented. So you make sure your eyes are dotted, your T's are crossed. But sadly, a number of staff don't pay attention to detail. You see emails with typos, poor use of punctuation and bad grammar. It doesn't speak well of you. Yeah. And then um, we have writing emails. With and we have, oh, we, have and an exam we have an example of a bad, we have uh, Christina shared an example, real life. You actually received this in your, <clears throat> in from one of your i don't know one of in the work in the in your your professional experience right no so so this was um a group conversation so one one of the members posted this as a problem they have they're communicating to a manager and this is how they send the information so i'm putting myself in the manager's shoes <laughs> how am i going to receive this, this kind of communication, I, I'll, I'll read it. I've been informed that the team came to my place of which I've never received anybody, only got a call, I'm already exhausted. 
<laughs> there are no commas, there are no periods, there's no... There is absolutely nothing. No yeah. commas, no periods, yeah. nothing. And it's negative. Imagine, and, yeah. imagine coming from a very serious board meeting and your staff member sends you this email to get to stress them more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we should be mindful of the way we communicate. Yeah. There should be punctuations in this. Yeah. Yeah, it's exhausting. In an other actual, it's exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> other tips. Other yeah. tips. Another one is writing emails in all caps or bold letters. Some people may not be aware of this, but should you write emails with all caps, it connotes that you are shouting or you are screaming. <laughs> Maybe that's not the intention, but that is what it's saying. You are just screaming yeah. on top of your voice. Yeah, so we have to avoid it. You also have long and messy email threads where the subject of, of discussion ends up being lost in the entire conversation. So let's try and avoid that. And one very important one is accidentally violating someone's privacy. When you send the wrong attachments or forward sensitive emails to the wrong person. Luckily, we have a, a about two to three seconds window of undoing a message, but if that window passes, it's gone. <laughs> And that can lead to lots of trouble. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good tips, really good tips. What about in oral communication? In oral communication, this is more of this point I'm going to make is more for managers because managers are the ones in a position of giving feedback to their staff. But the mistake I'm seeing is where the manager always gives a one-way feedback, but don't allow the staff to also make input into the conversation or ask them what their thoughts are, what would they want to get better at and stuff like that. Okay. And um, the next is poor setting of goals and expectations. This, is, this also comes to the manager, first of all, you need to, it's important to um, set expectations right with the, with the subordinates or, so that they can achieve them. And it has to be clearly defined, right? But there are mistakes, mistakes are made where the managers are just give an instruction, but the staff cannot do it, or they don't really understand what is expected of them and things can go amiss. Last but not least is not being concise during meetings and presentations. I think this is quite self-explanatory. Yeah. You yeah. don't need to think about the wish. Yeah. You know, so much, there's so much writing going on with the WhatsApp and the Slack and things where before maybe would people would pick up a phone now, I think they do a WhatsApp message or they do a Slack message. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit. We have a, you shared with us some of your, your you know, your top list for do's and don'ts for written communication. I wonder if you could share, what do you think are some of the most important things for people to focus on? Sure. First on my list is to use an active voice instead of a passive voice, right? In writing, you need to make sure that you, you are present in, in the writing. Don't write as though there's a third person who is going to execute the task. Right, right. <laughs> it's you address it to yourself. If it's the manager, assign roles if you're a manager. This person A is doing A, B, C, and D. Person B is doing that and that. Don't say, we will do this, we will do that. No, it should right. be present, it should be active. Like, I am responsible for this. I'm doing A, B, C, and D. Kwapna is doing X, Y, Z. Angie is doing C, W, X, you know? So it's clear. Yeah. And you also need to proofread your emails at least three times before you send it. If you have to send an email immediately, just take a moment, pause, just pause a bit and make sure that you've written it well. There are no typos before you send them. And should you be in a position where you have to send an email with lots of information, 
it's good to use tables or bullet points to simplify the data in emails. So the email is not overwhelming when the recipient receives it. But sometimes just by virtue of seeing the email pop up and it's very wordy, you're already overwhelmed, you know, and it can lead to other ripple effects. Right. So right. use tables, use bullets, make it simple, straight to the point. So it's not too heavy on the eye, okay? In addition to that point also is to use images and graphs where necessary to make your presentations less wordy. Okay. And um, in the in this current, current age, we're using a lot of technology, right? So we need to embrace it in the workplace as well. WhatsApp doesn't sound like a formal communication tool, but it's being used. <laughs> it's being yes, used. It is. So we should, yeah, we should embrace the use of mobile technology and applications to provide quick responses like a Slack, an Outlook, or WhatsApp. So I'm sure majority of us have smartphones. Let's not use our smartphones only for what I've used. I mean, you need to have your, you can have your email downloaded on your phone. So should you be out of the office and you're in the field um, doing some work and an email comes in, you can't respond in detail at the time, but you can just prompt the sender that, Thanks for the email. I would respond to you by end of day. You need to give a timeline by when you would respond. Don't, don't just say, I respond to you soon. Soon is vague. Right. Right. You need to give a specific time by which you should, you would respond. Okay. And you should also be mindful of the cultural differences from your audience or recipients. Once again, remember to proofread everything you write. It's important. You know, Christina. And you have someone, a second eye, have a look at it. Exactly. You know, if it, uh, I don't know if you all know this, but sometimes when we read, our eyes automatically fix the mistakes, and so sometimes mm -hmm. it's hard to see the mistake. Mm -hmm. If you like, in the um, on the Baobab chat, I'll share with you a PowerPoint that illustrates like why we do that. And so, proofreading is so important, and getting a second set of eyes can be really helpful too. Mm -hmm. And so our the don't, don't yeah, that don't no block letters. I said earlier, don't use social media lingo in formal writing. Even if it's a WhatsApp conversation, if it's your, it's with your manager. Don't I wouldn't advise you do that. Or when you're writing an email, make sure words are spelled fully with the, the right diction. I said right diction, right spelling. It should be spelled right. Example: Don't write people as P P L E. Don't write DA, D E A R as D I A. It's unacceptable. And a big reminder don't use vague or unclear subject headings or signature sign up. Yes. Don't. Yeah. You know, so often people will write me and they'll ask for a letter of recommendation or something, but they won't tell me the deadline. And I won't know that by when I have to do it. So putting, even like putting the deadline in the subject. Heading can be so helpful. Yeah. All right. So those are some nice tips for our oral and written communication. Um, I think in, in, as we come sort of to the end of our presentation, thinking about if helping people set up a strategy, like a strategy for how they can be, make sure that they can be the most effective communicator that they can be, what, what would you recommend for them? Number one is find a mentor. Because no one, no one can chart this path of life alone. We have an aim, there's, there's an end goal we want to get to. It's always helpful or it gives you an edge should you, if you have a mentor, someone who has been there before, someone who has worked in the workplace before, someone who has um, ventured into the business you want to engage in if you're an entrepreneur. And this mentor can guide you and provide even insight into challenges you may face in the workplace in future. Yeah. It's also important to develop the skills that are needed to be successful at the workplace. Attend trainings, take courses in areas where you fall short. It's very, very critical. You also need to build healthy relationships in the workplace. No one is a silo. We work with people, so it's important to have healthy relationships. 
with both your supervisors, your colleagues and subordinates alike. You also need to be receptive to, uh, be receptive to feedback. Like I say, feedback is not an attack. <laughs> it's room for growth. Should you, be, should you have good feedback? It means, okay, I've excelled at this, I can do better. If it's not too good a feedback, okay, how do I get better? How do I improve? So I'll be the best at my job. At the end of the day, we want to attain a company's success. So all that we need to do to make sure the company is successful while we are also successful should be taken into consideration and we should embrace it as, as um, people in the workplace. Another helpful tip is to be aware of the company culture. You need to know what the lines of communication are, what the bureaucracies in the workplace are, what exists. You need to know if the CEO wants you to address him as sir or just by his name. <laughs> All these dynamics come to play. You know, you need to be aware of it. Don't say you didn't know. Not knowing the law is not an, is not an excuse. Mm -hmm. Okay. We also yeah. need to strive for excellence. In, in, in my introduction, Elizabeth, you mentioned I'm passionate about excellence. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I always try to give things my best. And I demand excellence from my team. I tell them that I demand excellence from you. I don't want to redo your work. But that's a lot of time lost. Rework, it's, it's not a pleasant thing. It's time lost, it's money lost. It's waste of energy as well. So strive for excellence, do your work well. Make sure that you are the best at your job. A job well done is a delight to any supervisor or any manager. It's natural to have teachers pets because they are just good students. They don't give the teachers a hard time. <laughs> it's human nature. So should you be a subordinate and you do your work well, naturally your manager will like you. That's you know, it seems like such a simple thing, but it, it's so true. My, my husband is a manager and he has two employees. One always strives for excellence. And the other one just does kind of the bare minimum and it drives him crazy. Mm -hmm. And because he has to redo her work a lot yes. of the time. And so it, it seems so obvious, but it really does make a difference. It does, it does. And the next is when you are in doubt, always seek help and clarification. When you don't understand what has been assigned to you, always ask questions. Asking questions doesn't mean you are dumb at all, <laughs> it actually shows that you want to get the work done and done well. Okay, so always seek help, accept clarification when there's any misunderstanding, okay? I know, yes. like, and these, these two employees, the one that drives my husband crazy, she, does, she never asks for clarification and sometimes she'll do something wrong and the other one is always getting clarification. So it's such a good point, it's such yeah. a good point. Mm -hmm. And as, as a subordinate in the workplace, one way to, to tell whether you understand an instruction or communication well is to repeat it to your manager. Are you saying I should do A, B, C, and D right. in this way? Yeah. If that is not it, your manager will clarify. If he's a good one, <laughs> they'll clarify. Okay, and the last, is to be concise in your speech. There isn't a lot of time to play around. So straight to the point, let's get things done. If you have, um, if you have something to say and you can summarize them in, let's say three points, let's say point, I'm going to say this in three main, three main points, point one, point two, point three is this, and off we go, okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a helpful list, what a helpful yeah. list. Um, we have a lot of tools available to us to help us improve our communication. What are some of your favorites? One of, one of my favorites is um, Grammarly. I'm sure a number of us, if we are YouTuber, you should know, or if you watch YouTube videos, you should know Grammarly. It keeps popping up. <laughs> it keeps popping up. And even if you read blogs or articles online, they are there. Grammarly is all over, it's in our face. So there's no way we can send an email with typos because Grammarly is there to help us get us uh, right. Mm -hmm. It even helps you to send 
an email with the right tone, the right diction, all the five C's I talked about. It helps you coin the message so that it is just right. So let's yeah. use Grammarly, okay? There's also Microsoft Word Review. Very simple, basic. Then that's the button there. It has the editor function, the spelling and grammar, thesaurus, word count, you don't need that here, but it helps you review your work so that you don't send wrong memos or letters to your managers. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. That work out good. <laughs> yeah. And um, one new discovery is WebTune. WebTune works like Grammarly, so they are like sisters. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. It's a competitor of Grammarly. Okay. And you know, WebTune and Grammarly can be add-ons in web, uh, in, in Word or Microsoft Word. Okay. Just add, plug it in as an add-in into the application and it does your editing for you. Okay. We also have um, Chat GPT. I'm sure a number of us have heard about that. And my question is, so what I would say is use it with caution. It's important not to plagiarize. Don't use Chat GPT as the original content of your writing. No, it's not allowed. It's not acceptable. Just use it as a guide to fine tune your writing or to, mm. to, 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 to just guide and for you to know if um, the content is accurate or whatever you're saying is factual, but don't use it as the original content of, of your work. I think we're all I think we're all learning how to navigate that. I think it's yeah. it's a it's a new beast for us. I think Christina, <laughs> I think we're almost ready for our time for Q and A. Yeah. And so if I can just move ahead, we're gonna post this on the Baobab chat. So um here are some additional resources for us that um that that I think people will find helpful. We'll also put on the Baobab chat some of the other things we talked about. Um during the presentation. Um, I think we had a question. If we can move to the, thank you so much, Christina. Let me just say that was so, so helpful and such a nice, really such a complete, comprehensive overview and tips and pointers for all, all different ways we can work at becoming more effective in our communication. We'd like to open it up to chat and we have a chat, uh, to chat and to Q&A. We have a question from Dowdy, where he says, the challenge is to be a good worker and your supervisor loads you with more work, even that which ought to be done by others. How would you go around such a situation on your journey to being a great worker? What would, what would you recommend for that person, Christina? Okay. This is um, <laughs> quite interesting. I've heard, I've heard someone say the reward for a job world that is more work. <laughs> this is like an example. <laughs> you do your work well and your supervisor mm. do more work. It's, it's good to embrace more challenges because you grow, right? But should you be overwhelmed, it's important to talk to your manager that it's becoming too much for me to handle. And if you are taking more than you can handle, it's going to affect the quality of your delivery. So you need to have conversation with your manager and let him know that I can't do more than this. He should try and manage his expectations a bit and not over, overload you. But you should also not turn down more work. I would say, so don't turn down more work, okay? Yeah. That's a good, that's good. Yeah, you need that conversation with the, with the manager. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's look at, um, we have another question. Bernard asked, does attire really matter during an interview, like dressing casually for a managerial position? I've always heard that when you go to an interview, you mm -hmm. should try to dress 10% better than the people you're interviewing with, right? I don't know how you qualify that 10%, but 
Yeah, I think it really does matter because it shows professionally how you present yourself. And um, I think so. Bernard, I hope that answers your question. We have another, Stanley has his hand up. We're going to go to Samuel and then we'll go to Stanley. Samuel, do you want to read that for us, Christina? Do you see it? Um, seeing Samuel. Yeah. No I've been keen on interview yeah. success. After okay, successful. Keen on, yeah, yeah. I have been keen on interview after successful uh, application. How do my investing grade impact on the success of the interview? Yeah. Like, do they look at your grades? Do they, do they ask a transcript to see how you did? What do you think, Christina? So I'd say this is dependent on the role you're applying for and uh, what the company is looking out for. Personally, through my experience, I've not been so keen on your grades because grades don't say all about you. <laughs> yeah, great, great grades are not everything. I know some people have straight A's, but they come to the work world and they are lacking emotional intelligence or they are lacking interpersonal skills. Like if it's a sales role, then, then your score doesn't really matter. I want to see how you're able to win me over or win a client over. Right? So grades are important, right? But it's not, it, that, that is not all that matters, okay? Excellent question. Excellent question. Um, let's, um, uh, if you're, I don't know if that's a question. If your boss thinks that you're too smart or confident and can replace them, is it okay to lay low? Hmm. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> okay, I, I would say, how do you lay low? You have to be, I, I believe in excellence, please. Excel. Yeah. But one key thing is don't try to outshine your boss. Make your boss look good. Let your intelligence or your, <laughs> your excellence performance speak well for your boss. Let him shine through your work. And he will Let even promote you, really. Yeah. Let him look good through you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't let those, but don't, don't, don't be, um, how do I put it? <laughs> don't have a chip off your, off your shoulder or right. don't be too arrogant right. because you, you think you are more confident or you are more knowledgeable than your boss. No, it, it, it's not right. right. Um, let's go to Stanley and then we'll go to Julia. Stanley has his hand up. I don't know if he can be unmuted, Angela. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Christine and McDonald Elizabeth. I take this opportunity to ask you about two questions. So the digital age has brought many new ways to communicate, such as the email, Twitter, and Facebook. How has communication changed? What is it helpful? Uh -huh. What are the problems that you see when it comes to digital age and communication? Thank you. Great question, great question. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I have some thoughts too. What do you think, Christina? Yeah. So um, how has it been helpful? I would say it has been extremely helpful. Because we, 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 are, it's, we are in a fast, fast paced world now. So with Twitter, with um, WhatsApp, with emails, it makes sending information quicker and easier. So, and even with the, with the help of smartphones, it's easier on the field. You don't have to wait to get your laptop or your PC or let's say get to work the next day before you respond to an urgent email. Though that has been managed well, you need to have good boundaries. Yeah, yeah. So it has been very, very, very helpful, right? And on the business side too, it helps um, businesses to be more responsive to customers' needs. In times past, if a customer has complained, they'll go, to, example, like for a bank, they'll go to the bank branch, go lodge the complaint in a notebook. We never know whether it is read or not. We don't know if it's addressed or not. But now we have Twitter, we have Instagram, we have Facebook, and companies have accounts there. If you have a complaint and you lodge it on these, these um, applications, we are seeing a faster turnaround in response compared to times past. So they've been helpful. They've been helpful, but it needs to be managed well, I would yeah. say. Yes. 
I think I would add, I would add a comment. What I've seen is that it's making our email communication more direct. So instead of all of our communication more direct. So instead of starting with, hi, how's your family doing? I hope you're doing well. How's the weather? No, you start directly with the purpose of your message. And then she's laughing. And then at the end, you can say, hey, I hope your family's doing well. Thank you so much. And in American culture, if you say thank you, thank you, thank you, like as much as you need at the end, you can ask for almost anything. That's a little wow. cultural tip. Nice tip. <laughs> we have another question from Jul Julius. He asks, what basic skills are required for students to land internships easily? What do you think, Christina? Yeah, basic skill in internships, well, you're still in school around that time. So personally, I wouldn't place a lot of expectations on an intern. <laughs> My things I'll look out for is, or what I'll be impressed about is when I see an intern who has their resume on point. Yeah. Usually you have um, you you are expected to have your CV or your resume at the end of your program. But should you be coming for an internship and you have a CV or you have a resume, I'll give you a thumbs up. All right. And you need to you need to learn about the company you're applying for, you need to know about them so that you can ace your interview. So prepare well for the interview. Like the interview tips I gave you, know the company and you um, know the company well, their vision, their mission, what they're about and how you fit into the company. What value are you adding to the company? And you saw yourself best during the interview. There's no other place or no other time. And interviews are not very formal, are not always very formal these days. You could be having an interview over tea or coffee. Yeah. Or it could be, at days at the park, but you are being interviewed, you wouldn't know. So yeah. the fact that it's not in a formal setting doesn't mean that you should not pay attention to it. Yeah. Okay. So you need to make sure that your CV or your resume is on point. Prepare well towards the interview. Know about the company. Know how you fit into the company's culture and what is the value you are adding to the company, even as an intern. Yeah. Anything to add? I do. So, so. You know, in the whole application process, the, when they look at the resume, they want to know, can you do the job? Are you able to do the job? And in the interview, they're looking at, will you do the job? And are you a good fit for the company? And so they're looking kind of at how you're a fit. I think um, uh, a note next, I think next week, maybe Angela can put it in chat. Um, there's a Baobab event on how to uh, on internships and how to get an internship. So we'll put that information for you on the Baobab chat. Um, a question from Bernard. Do you want to read that for us, uh, Christina? Bernard is asking, if you are interested to work or intern at a particular big organization, can you proceed and apply without any adverts and explain to them how passionate you are with the organization? Yeah, you can. Yes, you can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll post in Baobab chat some examples of those. It's the cover letter. That's the key thing. Or, or you know, another approach you could take, Bernard, is to try to get an informational interview with, it, with the company. And, you know, use your LinkedIn and use your, we're, we're having a session on this later, um, later this year on, how you can use LinkedIn to find who you have common connections with and see if you have some connection who can introduce you to someone in the company so you can have an informational interview. That's another approach for it. Any other questions? Oh, hold on, wait, we have one more. Due to my current engagement, I'm unable to have a face-to-face -face internship. I'm trying to apply for one, but need more remote internships. I mean, I think, oh, and that's Helena. Oh, hi, Helena. Helena, I, I would just look for, for if it's a remote work, the, the, intern, the interview would be remotely, right? Helena, email me. Helena, you still have my email, right? You can email me privately. Let's, let's take that offline and to help me better understand, okay? And then we have a, me, a question from Vivian. What do you think, Christina? In case you don't feel comfortable, 
to change our browser. <laughs> it's a tricky one. <laughs> it is a tricky one. <laughs> to answer it, well, we need to know exactly what the discomfort is about. Yeah, right. Is it sexual harassment? Is right. it um, right. the company right. culture? There needs to be more information, more background to give appropriate recommendations. That's why you need a mentor. So when there are these challenging situations, you can go to them and say, I don't know how to deal with this. You know, can you help me? Mm -hmm. Richard also sends a question. Oh, I didn't see it. Hold on. Oh, met resume instead of CV. Is it okay to send a CV instead of a resume in an application? So CVs and resumes are almost the same thing. Yeah, yeah. The difference is the presentation. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the country of origin. CV is very British and resume is very American. Yeah. But yeah. it contains the same information. Yeah. yeah. CVs are just longer. I think that's another change I'm seeing with our social media mm -hmm. is people are preferring resumes a little bit more over CVs because they're shorter and they're yeah. they're easier to review. Yeah. And they don't um, contain very detailed information about your experiences. Right. projects that you've carried out, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. a listing in the resume is enough. Mm -hmm. My CV will try to provide more information. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think that's about it. That's it, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you so bye, much. Everyone. Thank you. Bye. Ooh, and I, we're breaking bounds on by.